information for a lot of you here. Um, we have uh, Olivia from Natural England talking about the Wildlife Incident Investigation Scheme. Um, so Olivia, good to see you again. Hey, yeah. You're right. hey, yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and sorry, we're a couple of minutes late, um, but you, yeah, you, you carry on and uh, tell us about the the WIS scheme. Brilliant. I've got I've got a question before I start. Um, genuine curiosity: If somebody's not checking traps, lethal traps, and an animal is not dead, would that not come as a, as an offence under the Wildlife Animal Welfare Act? That's what I was trying yeah. to say. That's when, it gets, that's when uh, I mentioned about them uh, making the decision themselves based on their location and they put it to prevent harm. And yeah, if, if harm occurs, yeah, there'll be a problem. But that's what they need to make sure harm doesn't occur and it's a, a clean kill. So yeah, it can get complicated then. But you're right, absolutely. Right. Oh, hi. Fabulous. I'll let you know when we can see your. Oh, uh, not, yeah, the top panel is it? How do we get rid of the top panel? Because I can't get it on the presentation. It's in the way. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's uh, down as if you drag the screen. Lauren might be able to assist you more with the device on that. <laughs> then I'll try again. Oh, dear. F5 usually starts. Uh, yeah, either, either F5 or down at the bottom, there's like a presentation right at the bottom. That you can click on next to your Zoom. Yeah. Either of those will start your presentation, if not F5. 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 Okay, I've got the presentation up. My problem is I can't get to the top bit. The the Zoom panel is across the top, which means I can't. <sighs> um, can you make your screen yeah. pick up? Did that work? Okay. So, Try again. <laughs> Try sharing again and it should work now. Hey, hey. So there we go. Fabulous. Thank goodness for that. Sorry about that. <sighs> okay. Yes, we're going to talk about the Wildlife Investigation Scheme. And from now on, I will call it WIS for obvious reasons. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so. Right now. A little bit about the background of the WIS scheme. So it is actually one of the longest running pesticide monitoring schemes in the world. And one form or another has been going since 1957. And um, the whole point of it is to investigate cases of pesticide poisoning of wildlife, companion animals and beneficial insects, basically anybody that's they think that's not meant to be targeted, as well as finding of the poison bait pesticide spillages where any harm to wildlife, companion animals, or beneficial insects is, is likely. Um, the scheme was given its regulatory powers in 1986. And since then, it's, sorry, it's, it's, it's now illegal to use um, any pesticides in a manner that's contrary to its approval status. And if you do so, that is an offence. Okay. So how does it work? So it's operated in England by Natural England. And that's what I'm going to talk about because I work for Natural England. Um, it's operated on behalf of the Health and Safety Executive, who I'll refer to as HSE from now on. And Natural England has WIS inspectors. We're warranted. And these warrants confer several powers of entry, as you can see listed here. And um, for anyone online that is not based in England, there are parallel schemes that run in the devolved countries. Um, and the links to those are on the HSE WIS webpage, which we can post into the chat. There are four WIS partners in this, in this sort of project and scheme. Um, Natural England's purpose is the investigative capacity. So we manage the acceptance, rejection of cases into the scheme. We deploy the inspectors to conduct either field or desk-based investigations and to gather any evidence required. AFA provide the post-mortem testing of all carcasses that are submitted. And with current avian influenza situations, they also conduct the testing for avian influenza before anything is um, 
post-mortem, basically. FERA provides a scheme scientific testing capacity, conducting the forensic analysis on all samples that are submitted. So that's toxicology tests. And HSE maintain oversight and ownership of the hardware scheme, including accountability to government and ind industry. And um, it's actually industry that pay for this scheme. They enable it to run. Next page. We have two objectives, statutory objectives to the risk scheme. The first objective is monitoring. Um, this is to provide information to the regulator, HSC, on any of the hazards to wildlife, animals, insects caused by the pesticides. Um, the scheme was designed to identify any unexpected effects by analysing the animal deaths caused by either the correct or incorrect use of pesticides. And this is important. So even if a product is being used correctly as per legally authorised use and the label instruction state, if non-target species are affected, the regulator needs to know, obviously, so they can act on that information. So the scheme is basically a monitoring tool to inform the pesticide approval process. So when, a, when, when the authorization changes or a product is taken off the market altogether, this is how, how it's happened. It's that, you know, basically the monitoring has kept feeding back into the system and eventually they've realized that things need to change. The second objective is enforcement um, to enforce the correct use of pesticides, identifying and penalizing those who deliberately or recklessly misuse or abuse pesticides. So just some examples of the, the, the species that are covered, but also, you know, the, the species that we see frequently submitted into the scheme. Attention, please. Natural England have I hope you can't hear that as an announcement. Today. So the first one covered is companion animals, pets, basically. And the most common animal referred to the scheme is dogs. And of dogs, it's Labradors mostly, because let's face it, they'll eat anything. Um, then we have wildlife, and it's generally those that eat carrion, dead stuff, or prey on small mammals and rodents, um, which could be carrying, obviously, escars. Um, and your most common species that are submitted to the scheme is birds of prey, like buzzard, red kite, even white-tailed eagle, and also owls. We get quite a few tawny owls. Um, also corvids, all of them, all species of corvids, and pigeons, which are the um, bird equivalent of Labradors, I guess. Other species, it's obviously all wild mammals, not just companion animals. Um, and the most common ones we get are foxes and badgers, and believe it or not, deer. Um, but we also get squirrels, bats, rabbits, and hedgehogs. And you know, even if it's a, a gray squirrel that's submitted, yes, it's an invasive species, but if it's dying, dying as a consequence of consuming pesticide in any way, then it, it still needs to be explored, obviously. Oh, hedgehogs. Did I mention hedgehogs? Obviously hedgehogs. Um, and then the beneficial invertebrates or insects is predominantly bumblebees, honeybees and earthworms, but most cases revolve around honeybees and bumblebees. Okay, so those are the kind of species we, we're getting mostly submitted into the scheme. There are three stages to a RIS investigation. Uh, the first stage is the initial report. We have a team of advisors who manage the hotline and filter out all of those, uh, anything that's basically not relevant to WIS or pesticides. We do get a lot of calls of just please for help, anything related to wildlife. So um, they do a great job of filtering it all out. Um, and they're taking this information, it, it includes, it's a bit like to, taking a crime report, they're getting all the basic details, but they're also carrying out background checks, intelligence checks on the location to identify any previous incidents in the vicinity. Um, they're looking at the locations in the vicinity that are likely to, you know, is there anyone there that's likely to be using pesticide professionally, but they've, they've just not done it right? Or is it, or is it more residential? If it's somebody residential using off the shelf um, pesticides, then that's not for the WIS scheme. Um, and 
common places we're sort of looking at in the vicinity of the area of the dead animal would be things like farms, hospitals, schools, game management areas, poultry farms, anywhere that's going to be using it professionally. Step two is the case is then passed to um, a WIS warranted inspector for decision on whether to accept the case into the scheme or not. So why do we need the second stage? It's basically a, a way of peer reviewing. Um, we're, you know, by peer reviewing it with a second person, we're, we're ensuring we, we really do want to take this case or not, but it's appropriate to take the case or not. So this second level of deciding whether to accept or reject the case into the scheme will involve a reassessment of all of that information already collected. Um, but also some more in-depth investigation at this stage, mostly desk-based, but it can be field-based sometimes as well. We're a national team, should have mentioned, um, that work within Natural England's enforcement team. We are national um, and we get cases obviously everywhere and anywhere. Um, and sometimes we will work with other organisations if, you know, if, if there's a, an animal carcass that needs collecting or we want to do a site investigation, we might call on partners to help us cover certain areas of the country. So that could include RSPCA, local police officers, National Wildlife Crime Unit, um, and other organizations. Um, on here, I've got some, some pictures. These are the kind of pictures that are submitted when somebody informs us of a potential pesticide poisoning. And they can give us so much information. I mean, the one on the right is quite obvious. This is like white foamy vomit around the badger's mouth. That's suspicious straight away. But the bird of prey on the left, so you've got a, a clenched talon there, and that can sometimes um, be a sign that the, the animal died unnatural in an unnatural way. It's clenching. Um, if there's earth or food in its bill or its mouth as well, that can tell you a lot about the behavior of the, of the, the animal before it died. Um, okay, the third step, the investigation. Um, this is when it's been accepted into the scheme. It's allocated to another inspector. And, and then they, they basically own that case then right, right through to the end. They'll investigate, collect any evidence, site visits, um, desk based coordination of the samples, getting the carcasses or samples to APA, to FERA, liaising between all the scheme partners and communications with the police. So back to stage one, reporting of the cases. Um, the case is typically first reported in the risk scheme through one of these methods, but mostly it's members of the public. Um, either directly or via one of these partners. So they've generally found a carcass or often observed an animal behaving oddly. Really awesome. Before it dies. Outside. Thank you. They search the internet to, um, for help and come across the web webpage, or like I said, go by one of these partners and um, submit it to the WIS scheme. We do also occasionally receive reports of herbicides harming animals, which is interesting. That doesn't go into the risk scheme, but we would just forward that straight to HSE to investigate. So at this stage, when we've accepted the case, um, as I said, we look a little, we look a lot deeper, not, not just a little bit. Um, and it, there are essential guidelines and criteria that we have to follow. So is there an animal dead or ill? Do we know that? Is there, are there reasons to believe pesticides involved? Um, are there reasons, do we know whether a professional pesticide user was involved? And the absence of any of that really, it, it'd be tempting to accept everything into the scheme, but we can't. We have to have the justification to accept it into the scheme. And factors influencing acceptance could include the quantity and species of the animals involved and finding the bait. So if, if we are, you know, member of the public have actually found pellets or granules that look suspicious, a veterinary opinion, um, previous incidents in the actual vicinity, because that is kept on file, 
and any information or intelligence from the police or other partner agencies. So I remember I had a case last year where we had no other evidence, but the local police asked us to submit it for WIS because they had an ongoing investigation in that area. And then we have the, the opposite, reasons for rejection. So possible reasons we'd reject it would be there's no carcass or casualty available. Um, last week, we actually had one submitted to the RS, by the RSPCA. Somebody had called into them a whole load of animals that they'd found out on a walk. By the time the RSPCA got there, there was nothing left, nothing vanished, all gone. Again, that will go onto our system. We'll record it. Um, but we can't accept it into the scheme to investigate. Obviously, there's nothing to, there's nothing there to investigate. Um, also, things like victim that the, the body's found next to a main road, or there's overhead power beneath power, you know, birds of prey can be found beneath power cables next to a train track. Um, if there's no other evidence suggesting pesticide, then I think it's you know it's quite clear that it was something else. And also, if a victim's carcass is over two weeks old, it makes it really difficult to get any forensic evidence from that. There is also other things to think about. If you know a bit of information about, you know, yeah, the evidence that was there, or somebody watched the behaviour of a bird before it died, it can tell you things. So it could be disease, lead poisoning, shot, herbicide, amateur use of pesticides, which we get a lot of um, dead foxes local residents, poisoning foxes, and things like that, we refer to the police. There are other types of chemical poisonings of animals or wildlife that are not, well, they don't come under the risk scheme. Um, examples is the, one example is the antifreeze, which contains ethylene glycol, um, can cause fatal kidney failure in cats, basically. Veterinary products can be harmful to wildlife, but the jurisdiction for this falls to the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. And as I mentioned before, there's the amateur use incidents. So if we believe somebody's abusing um, pesticides in an Ahiba hood, somebody residential, they're buying the stuff off the shelf in B&Q, um, we can't take that into the WIS scheme, but we, we recommend to the person that's informed it to report it to their local council and the police. Um, there, there does seem to be um, a fear of calling things into the police. So sometimes I will actually chase that up. And if they haven't re reported it to police, I'll do it for them. It's not our job to do that. But you get a lot of calls saying there's been 17 fox deaths in the last year. I'm like, well, have you told anybody? No. Well, how are we supposed to know? How is anybody supposed to know? How are the police supposed to know? Okay. So usually once all the samples have been analysed by Ferrer um, and we've got to the point where we, we hopefully know what's killed the animal, it will be uh, given or categorised, it will be categorised in one of these four categories. Um, there's many instances where we, we kind of know which category to put it in from the beginning, but it's up to Ferrer at the end of the investigation to put put that status on it. So it's approved use, misuse, abuse, or unknown. And approved use, this is where pesticide is used in accordance with its conditions of authorization. So you followed the instructions on the label correctly. And the, inform the information we collect during any approved use investigation is used by HSE to further investigate the unintended side effects of the approved pesticide on animals, and they take the necessary action, which could be withdrawing the approval altogether, modifying the conditions of use, or feeding back to the manufacturer and working with them if they'll consider changing the chemical formula or concentrations, if that's enough. Misuse, this is where the product has not been used according to the conditions of its authorization, so generally didn't read the label properly, but it might be carelessness, ignorance, accidental or forgetfulness without the intention of deliberately harming non-target animals. But the consequences could be disastrous. And typically this type of incident is resolved with advice, best practice guidance and written warnings. We do our best to help people to comply. We do we'll work with people as much as we can. But if somebody makes a habit of misusing, then that will eventually lead to uh, further enforcement action. Abuse. 
So this is when a pesticide has been deliberately used in an illegal manner with the intent to poison or attempt to poison a non-target animal or species. And this obviously gets the harshest response. Um, cases like this will be passed to the police for criminal investigation, who will will carry on working sandwich, will carry on working with the police through the investigation to the end. And then there's unknown or unspecified. So in some cases, pesticides have been found in the toxicology tests, but the origin of the substance is unclear. We don't know where the animal consumed it or how. And the feral lapse can't conclusively identify the cause of death. So this will be classified, categorized as unknown. They can also come from, you know, if a carcass, like I said before, after two weeks, really not going to get much from a carcass. So if a carcass is too old um, or there was bad weather or too much predation on the carcass, this, you know, there's things like that. Um, as an example, I looked at the stats for 2023 and I've got approximate percentages of the categories of the cases we uh, um, looked at. So approved use, 0%, misuse, 9%, abuse, 21%, and the rest, unknown or unspecified, 70%. So I think that gives a, a really good idea. I mean, abuse, 21%, is quite high. If you, if you take out the equation, the unknown and the unspecified, 21%, um, I think it's quite a lot. Um, anyway, now we're going to look at some examples of those four categories to give you a better idea, hopefully. So the first one is approved use. So a reminder, this refers to when a pesticide has been in, used in accordance with its um, conditions of authorization, but it still had an unintended impact. So I think the most perfect example is new neonicotinoid insecticide, I always struggle saying that. So a farmer has sprayed on his crop in line with the conditions of use to control an infestation of black bean aphids. However, this had an unintended consequence or impact on a honeybee colony in an apiary adjacent to the crop field. As the bees flew through the crop and became contaminated with the pesticide, and they obviously took it back to the colonies with them, which resulted in the death of a number of colonies of the honeybees. So the information collected in, in a case like this would be um, passed back to HSC, who would then use this to conduct their investigations further. And um, I think we all know the use of neonicotinoid insecticides was changed. <laughs> so misuse. Sorry. To the next one, Debbie's. So misuse, uh, misuse, the... This refers to when a pesticide has not been used in accordance, but it could have just been accidental or careless use, no intent to you know, purposely kill something, um, a non-target species that is. So in the left image, um, yeah, unprotected rodenticide bait to, to use against rats, an excessive amount of bait. Um, and unless there was evidence pointing, other evidence pointing towards abuse, this would be classed as misuse. Um, so yeah, it's thoughtlessness, rat problem, trying to saturate the rats. Um, the rodenticide is clearly not being used outside of, um, is clearly being used outside of the conditions of its authorization. And there seemed to be it's basically, yeah, nothing, nothing there that was preventing non-target species from being able to access it. And in the right hand image, um, oh, pretty colors, isn't it? Metaldehyde slug pellets, this would be misuse case, as they've not um, been, a, well, basically they've been banned for out or use in the UK since March 22. Um, and it may be a case that we're just trying to use leftover supplies. Um, yeah. Other things to bear in mind, so failure to secure a redenticide bait pack inside a bait box could be classed as misuse as called failing to search for diseased rats following the use of rodenticide. So increasing the risk of secondary poisoning to scavenger species. Ooh. So 
this is my definition of a disastrous consequence um, and it happens a lot. This pooch died after eating from unsecured rodenticide bait. The vet recognised what might be rodenticide poisoning and so this Labrador was submitted to WIS. And the investigation found that the farmer had used Escar diphenacum in bait stations to treat a rat infestation. He'd covered the bait boxes with roof tiles to secure them, but this was insufficient for a curious dog to gain access. And the bait boxes were close, in close proximity to a public right of way. The farmer's treatment reports were seized. Uh, the farmer had not carried out an environmental risk assessment. And the risk assessment would or could have identified that there was a risk to non-target species, such as dogs, given the proximity to a public right of way. And um, the post-mortem and toxicology analysis confirmed that there were extremely high levels of diphenacum in the dog's liver, which caused its death. So the results of this investigation, um, as it was believed there was no malicious intent here, a formal written warning was issued. So it's not a lot, but I think anyone, anyone involved, the farmer will have been very upset. And I don't think they'd want to do it again. Uh, it might have only had a written warning, but that will remain on file forever. So there is, you know, that that, that, that hopefully that's a deterrence of further misuse, and then they do things better in the future. Olivia, just a quick reminder. There's five minutes um, left of the presentation, just so a time's flown by. But I just thought I'd give you a quick reminder. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, first. <laughs> So third case study, abuse, um, pesticide, which was deliberately used in an illegal, illegal manner. Um, common indicators of abuse can be poison baits like this pheasant. I think anybody who saw that would um, realize that that's not a natural color for a uh, pheasant in it. This was found outside a pheasant pen and we accepted it into Wiz, obviously. And we carried out a site visit the very next day with the local police and the National Wildlife Crime Unit. Um, Carried out searches in pesticide stores around the vicinity of the pheasant pens, all around the area, basically. What did we find? We found a number of banned pesticides, four dead buzzards, and photos of dead birds of prey on a mobile phone. All of these were seized, and analysis did reveal at least one buzzard's death was attributed to one of the banned substances that was found. So in total, there were 11 offences and a guilty plea. And the last point, I think, is, is quite important and um, detrimental to this person's career. Their firearms licence was revoked. So the, the next few slides are just about the, the um, roles of the different partners. So as I said, AFA um, carry out the postmortems, um, which can cause it to it can stop there. It could be that the animal's been hit by a road traffic. You know, there could be really obvious signs that don't lead to um, pesticides. Um, but the postmortem can also identify foreign food materials not fed by a pet owner, for example, or prepared foods that's got been used as bait. Um, and a lot of things can be seen actually in the in the crop. So the image on the left. Um, shows that this red kite di died by an anticoagulant inter internal bleeding. Um, yeah. And the next one is Ferrer, who carry out the pest uh, pesticide toxicology analysis. Um, they'll interpret the results, they'll accumulate all of the information from all of the partners' investigations uh, and categorize it at the end. And anything that's um, categorized as an abuse case will go to the police and National Wildlife Crime Unit. Lastly is HSE, who own the scheme. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. Sorry, rushed few last slides. No, fabulous, fabulous. I think um, um, a lot of this subject is quite, quite new to everybody and, and understanding what WIDS do. We've got four questions uh, in the Q&A bit and they're all pretty much the same. So I'll just uh, 
summarize what it is and I, I, I suspect that it would it would be this but why the amateur use side of things why why is that not uh, dealt with and or how is it dealt with as well if it's not you guys it, yeah that's an interesting question it, it I think it's reviewed um you probably know this better than me Natalie but I think it's reviewed from time to time by the government oversight group so Anything we come across, anything that's fed back to HSC, who, who we work with closely, obviously, anything from FERA is fed into the government, um, crew government oversight group. Mm -hmm. And they have various different working groups in there that will look into different things. So we don't have a direct link with that, but there is ongoing yeah. discussions somewhere. I mean, I think if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, but with how much you use it say you know bob or sarah down the road sorry if anyone's names are not picking on it's just the first names that popped into my mind uh you know using a you know amateur use product they bought from somewhere and they're misusing it or abusing it or whatever it may be that's reportable probably to the police they have wildlife departments don't they they can deal yeah. with it independently yeah. rather than there is a really really long list on the hse website about which authority looks after to which property so you know whether it's a tennis club or a gymnasium or a church or and it's basically yeah it's whether it's local authority hse or natural england it's complicated but mm -hmm. i always say if it's local authority they haven't necessarily got the resource to investigate so i always say to report it to police as well because if there's potential for dogs or children mm -hmm. getting poisoned you know I, um my mum's neighbor last she was just throwing sachets of redenticide she bought in the shop out in her back garden and she had a puppy you know just people just they don't think yeah yeah they don't but i think it's, it's right a lot of products i think we can all be guilty of those things like you know i bought some bleach the other day for example my bathroom do i sit there and read the label probably mm. oh, should do actually so it's probably i maybe use it on surfaces i shouldn't but um i'm gonna go and read the label now and i think it's the same with pesticides unfortunately amateurs buy it and they're like oh you know okay i'm just gonna put it in a tray get put yeah. it somewhere where something can eat it and, and yeah. die hopefully it you know, says they, rat poison it'll only kill rats exactly yeah there's nothing else or eat it it's designed for rats so surely everything else will go no that's not for me um so yeah i think it's just an, an ignorance really isn't it on on that side it's un, unfortunate yeah. but um human beings i think isn't it um I know it's uh, it's definitely a an important subject, but yeah, they they were all the questions pretty much in terms of. I mean, one more popped in. Uh, the percentage of cases displayed here shows that gamekeepers slash shooting estates is the major problem. Is this correct? Um, going the which figures are they going on the ones I the percentages I read out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think just I mean just generally rather than look at specific figures yeah, no. issues around you know rural areas or you know i wouldn't say it's any 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 more than the other we do get a lot a lot of our misuse cases are probably agricultural um yeah yeah, uh, yeah. abuse cases probably more wildlife predator management yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the on the estates where they don't want those predators preying on things, they don't want them to prey them on. Yeah, it's mm. a complicated subject. Well, brilliant. We went one minute over in the end, but that's all. That's all good. It's uh, yeah, um, perfectly timed. Thank you so much for delivering that. And um, is there if anyone has any extra questions, they possibly they might put it in the chat section. So just maybe keep an eye on that. That'd be great. And you can type some answers if they do. But they're all the ones that, that I've seen so far. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks, Olivia.